If you want to understand the Buddhist teachings on that self, you have to see how those teachings fit into the context of the Four Noble Truths. Remember, the Four Noble Truths have their duties. Suffering or stress is to be comprehended. Craving the cause of suffering and stress is to be abandoned. The cessation of stress and suffering is to be realized, and the path to its cessation is to be developed. And so the perception of not-self, if we want to understand it, we have to see how it fits into those duties. For example, with comprehending suffering and stress. Comprehending means to understand these things to the point where we have no more passion, aversion, or delusion toward them. And so what is suffering and stress? Clinging to the five aggregates, or the five clinging aggregates. But it's basically the clinging. The aggregates themselves are not the problem, it's the clinging. We want to see how we cling is suffering and stress, comprehended. And it's hard, because we're clinging because we think something is going to lead to happiness for us. It's going to be our satisfaction. And so we apply the perception of not-self to see that the things that we cling to cannot provide the satisfaction that we want. But the real action in the Four Noble Truths is to abandon craving. Because that's the cause of the problem. And you do that by following the Eightfold Path, developing the Eightfold Path. Now, in developing the path, you use the perception of not-self first with things that would pull you away. Be afraid to observe the precepts because of your fearing loss of wealth, loss of health, loss of relatives. The Buddha has you remind yourself that those things are not under your control. You can't really hold on to them. They slip through your fingers, and losing them doesn't consign you to hell. Whereas loss of right view, loss of virtue, would. So you regard them as not self, but you hold on to the path. Same as when you're practicing concentration. Anything that would pull you away, if you regard as not self, you hold on, though, to the breath, or whatever your object of concentration is. But you develop these qualities virtue, concentration, discernment. So you can apply them to that problem of why you crave things, even though the craving itself causes, causes suffering and stress. Because suffering is not going to end until you abandon the craving. In fact, that's what the cessation of suffering is. It's the total abandoning of craving. So you look more carefully at the craving, the kind of craving the Buddha lists as cause of suffering comes in three kinds, craving for sensuality, for becoming, for non-becoming. In each case, he says, this is a kind of craving that leads to more becoming. For example, with sensuality craving, you have a desire for a particular pleasure. You like to fantasize about the pleasures. And in the fantasy, you create a world. There's the world in which that pleasure exists and can be attained. And then there's you in that world who you hope will be able to attain it. As for craving for becoming itself, sometimes we like the identity in and of itself. It gives us a sense of power. We're able to function in a world where we understand what the world is all about, we know its ins and outs, and we're capable of manipulating them for whatever pleasure we want. And the Buddha wants you to see that Wherever there's a becoming, there's going to be a clinging. And the becoming itself is made out of events that really are not you or yours. You can see them arise and pass away. You can see that they're stressful in the fact that they arise and pass away. The fact that they arise and pass away means they can't be you. Because if you see something arising, it's not you. 
you can't see yourself arise, you can't see yourself pass away. If you're there before it's arising and after it's passing away, it can't be you. And if it's not really under your power, then it can't be yours. The problem is you can't simply decide, okay, I'm going to crave to put an end to this becoming that I've got. Because that craving in itself turns into a clinging, and that creates more becoming as well. So what we have to learn how to do is take these things apart, see the process by which a becoming comes into being. This is what dependent arising is for. And when you take these things apart into their constituent factors, the things that they depend on, you begin to realize that none of those are really worthy of holding on to. Again, because they're impermanent or inconstant, because they're stressful, and not really totally under your control. You can influence them to some extent, but then you often find yourself pulled into things that if you actually looked at the fine print, you wouldn't have signed on for. Yesterday someone asked me, how can you say that we identify with things that we think we control? when we find ourselves identifying with fear. Or you're identifying with the mind, what the mind th comes up with. In the process of identifying with that, then whatever it comes up with, you're going to be stuck with. And if you try to destroy that identity, you create a new identity, but that's more setting yourself up for the same sort of situation, where you weren't really looking carefully at what you were getting when you signed on to have this identity in this particular world. So it's in seeing the, the drawbacks of these things, and that's what that standard contemplation is. You see things in terms of their origination, in terms of their passing away, how they come and go based on causes, some of which you can control, some of which you can't. And then you begin to look at the allure. Why do you go for these things? And part of the allure is in that sense of control, and part of it, of course, is in whatever other pleasure you would create around them. And so if you can see that these things are inconstant, stressful, you ask yourself, why would I want to identify with them? And that's the escape. And the escape is dispassion. Dispassion for what? Dispassion for your your craving. That's how you get out of the process of becoming without falling into the trap of craving for not becoming. Now, the whole reason we do this is because of the promise of that third noble truth, that if you can let go of these things, if you can develop this dispassion, then you're free. The image they give in the canon is of a fire. The fire is trapped in its fuel, not because the fuel is trapping it, but because it's holding on. If you can learn how to get let go, the things that you cling to are not going to hold on to you, as John Lee used to say. If you don't eat your plate of rice, the rice is not going to cry. You're the one who's attached to the food. But if you can get to the point where you don't need that food anymore, it's not going to come clinging after you. That's how freedom is found, by your letting go. Now, the special feature of not-self is that it differs from inconstancy and stress in one important area, which is that, as the Buddha says, all fabricated things are inconstant, all fabricated things are stressful. But then we get to not-self, it says all phenomena which would be fabricated and unfabricated are not-self. That's because it is possible to cling to something unfabricated, to have an experience of the discernment that reveals to you the deathless. You're going to hold on to that if you're not fully clear about what's happening. You have to learn how to let go of that as well. It's only then that your, your release is total. 
So this is why that at the end of the path, you let go of the path. You have to let go of the path. John Mahabhava's example is of a ladder up to the roof of a house. You climb the ladder, rung by rung by rung, holding on to one rung and then letting go of the lower one and holding on to a higher one, letting go of the lower one, holding on to a higher one, up, up, up. But as long as you're holding on to the ladder, you can't get to the roof. But if you let go in the meantime, you're going to fall down to the ground. You let go at the right point, at the right time. It's in this way that all Four Noble Truths eventually become things that you simply let go. As John Munn would say, the Four Noble Truths become one. And that one truth has one duty, which is that you let go. And then beyond that, you, as you get into the dimension that remains, where there is no clinging at all. There are no duties at that point. There's a passage in Mutodaya, the teachings of Ajahn Man, where he says that the Third Noble Truth is not the same thing as Nirvana. It's the realization of Nirvana, but Nirvana itself has no duties. And at that point, none of the three characteristics apply, none of the three perceptions apply. No perceptions really apply at all. If you were to say it's self, that would be clinging. If you say it's not self, that's muddying up the waters. That's something that is really pure. So when we understand that not self is a perception and it has its uses on the path, and its uses are dictated by the duties of the Four Noble Truths, that's when we can get the most use out of it. That's why the Buddha taught it to begin with. We're suffering because we're craving. We use this perception to abandon the craving. And then like any tool, say you've been building a, a chair. Okay, once you're finished with the chair, you put down your tools as well. You're totally unburdened. That's the promise. It's been made by someone who was always true to his promise. And it's simply up to us to be true as well. <laughs>